So we're going to keep moving on. Um, here, the next session is, is Jackie Suarez. And Jackie is, um, and Ross and family farm at Larpent in southwest Victoria. Um, as I said earlier, you always find something out about people you think you know a reasonable amount. So as Jackie mentioned, she's not born and bred farmer, having been raised in the Wimmera with four siblings and a, um, a somewhat aspirational public service career from family, which was going to be a, um, a trained nurse, which um, though from there, to Jackie's ultimately spent most of her working life as a CEO for, for, for purpose, organisation working with people with disabilities and their families. For the period that Jackie's led that very small and sometimes financially challenged organisation has now become a significant presence in the South West, supporting more than 100 people with disabilities, employing 65 staff with a multi-million dollar turnover and being the recipient of numerous business awards. And as you get to know Jackie, there's not a lot of surprises that that's the outcome. So while that was all happening, Ross and Jackie established their own enterprise started as share farmers, expanding their herd and ultimately buying their own farm at Larbert. They have a, all, a passion for all things black and white. Jackie and Ross achieved their Master Breeder Award in 2019, which congratulations, it's a great um, award for anyone that's 20 years plus contribution. Since retiring, and the retiring's in brackets, so I'm not sure what that means, Exactly, Jackie, but um, from a more public role, she does keep busy. Deputy Chair of West Vic Dairy, managing DLS's social page, so that probably every now and then has to keep Brian in check a little bit about his efforts on social media. Um, has now taken up the role as a director of Holstein Australia and has taken up the position of coordinating Ginfo after being a long-term Ginfo participant. Um, a musician, family historian, a poet, which I found out once again preeminently. Jackie and, and Ross are proud mother and father of four children and besotted Mimi of seven grandchildren. So welcome to the stage, Jackie. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, and. The instructions always from the children is, Mum, don't be boring and don't let people go to sleep. So I'm wondering if we've got a screen. There we go. This kind of is going to look a bit odd um, as an opening screen at a gene, or, or at a data gene presentation. This is a picture of our youngest granddaughter, uh, Ed. Edwina Grace, and she's sitting in what's called a mud sink. Anyone who's younger than I am might know what a mud sink was, I didn't. Um, proudly made by her mum and her auntie Nat um, while we were work, having a family working bee at what we call Ninny's house, which is Ross's grandmother's house, a little cottage at Horden Vale, um, which has really been our pandemic survival kit. Um, and I'm really proud um, the day after International Women's Day to have raised two daughters that not only um, hold down very significant and challenging jobs at times, but they can rustle through the rubbish heap out the back of the house and they can find an old sink and some bits of timber and they can get the drop saw and the nail gun out and they can make a mud sink for the kids to play in. Um, so, you know, I think that's not a bad job as a parent. Horden Vale is Ross's spiritual home. It's a little community along the Great Ocean Road west of Apollo Bay, um, and it's where he grew up. It's, um, and this particular picture and shot looks across land that's now part of our, well, form part of our business um, as his family's tra transitioned through a succession plan. The Calder River runs through the property, through the family farm, and the Calder family were early settlers of the district, um, and that's Ross's paternal grandparents' um, family. So hence the Calder Bray stud prefix. And I'll circle back to this picture so it kind of makes some sense. This one's going to look even kind of weirder. 
But I'm in that picture, the blonde one with the long hair. I grew up in store with four of my siblings, one who's actually not in this picture. Um, but music was what we did in my family. My dad worked on the Shire, but he was um, quite a well-known and respected musician, both classical and um, jazz, and we all learnt and played in the brass band. This is in the 1960s and women um, didn't learn brass instruments. It wasn't actually considered appropriate. Um, and the advice my father was given was he was wasting his time teaching us to play brass instruments because we just got married and had children and stopped playing. Um, surprise, surprise, I'm 62 years old and I still play in our local brass band and I really enjoy that. But I learnt um, from my dad, who was a man of extracting and exacting standards, that practice matters and that you have to do things again and again and again until you get it right. Um, there were, as I said, five of us. Most of us learned at least one, if not two, if not three instruments in a 12 square house, all doing practice at the same time, with dad in the kitchen in the middle, yelling when you needed to do it again because you hadn't done it right. Um, it sounds funny, but that, in the back of my mind, it kind of forms part of your psyche, part of the way you operate, part of the way you think, understanding that doing things over and over again and constantly striving to improve actually matters for the rest of your life. Uh, Dad was also somewhat of a philosopher and there were two poems in particular that I remember and anyone who grew up in the 60s and 70s might have had the same, um, same things on their wall. The desiderata was firmly on the wall in, uh, above the fireplace go placidly amidst the haste. Read it if you haven't read it, it's really worthwhile. The other was one about, that said, if a man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it's because he hears the beat of a different drummer. Let him step towards the music that he hears, however far or measured, however measured or far away. Which, mean, which really meant, you know, think for yourself. You don't have to be part of the flock. Use, your, use what you know. Um, and it's okay to be different. Um, Dad had a couple of funny um, expressions. I think I might have had one somewhere in here. I can't remember quite where. But he had a thing, an expression he used that was called, um, jo he's joined the Jacks Club. And that joining the Jacks Club meant, you know, bugger you, Jack, I'm all right. The modern translation of that is you can either be part of the solution or you're part of the problem. And that's the other um, really strong foundation for the way um, I've always thought. We can either try and help make things better or we're just sitting back whinging. Family historian, um, I noticed um, in the introduction, you know, the slight, how on earth do I say this woman's name? Uh, years ago, I was competing in, a, in an estate in Geelong and the announcer announced that the next singer to come out, his name was Jacqueline Suarez. And I thought, oh, she sounds really posh and flash. I wonder who that is. And then I realised he was actually talking about me. And I'd... So one of the questions I've always had is where does, that, um, where does that name come from? And so I really got interested in family research, uh, family history, and how, where does the name Suez or Suarez, is how it should be correctly pronounced, come from? And um, that got me looking at lots of things, and I discovered this wonderful resource called Trove, which is the digitalised um, national records. And I found, lo and behold, um, all of these records around herd testing, you know, who knew in 1937 the herd test records were actually published in the paper, in the national papers? This one's from the Weekly Times, but they were published in the Age, in the Argus. We sell, you know, the community celebrated that. What a good idea. Maybe that's worth bringing back. Um, in this particular one, uh, and I'll put this one there because it's the most clear and easy to see, but you'll see... Um, L. Sewers, so that's Ross's grandfather. Her testing in the 1930s and the 1940s. And, I, and this cow, there's a cow in there called Magpie, and that really jumped out at me because as a Holstein breeder, Magpie's a pretty well-known um, cow family in Australia. And so I asked Ross's dad, um, you know, tell me a bit about this Magpie cow that your father had. And um, 
And she did, you know, one year she, she actually won, you know, the, the most productive cow in the district. And he said to me, oh, no, she wasn't really anything special. Um, Dad just did really well that year because it had been a drought. He destocked. It had rained. The grass had grown. Um, she was probably by a scrub ball from out the Cape which is Cape Otway, and she was really nothing special. That gives you a bit of a glimpse of his dad's view of the dairy industry. Um, and he really wasn't encouraging of us going into dairy. He was um, had quite comfortably um, running beef by then. One of the other things I found, which I've always found quite interesting, was there was a Royal Commission into the failure of the soldier settlement schemes in the 1920s. Uh, and when you get to the very end of that Royal Commission and what they found was that basically the farm sizes were too small, the farmers lacked capital, and the farmers didn't have the necessary skills. And I thought, lo and behold, again, not much has changed in 100 years. Those things could still perhaps be seen to be relevant. Uh, Ross's, fam Ross's parents own three farms, three dairy farms down, um, on, down at Horton Vale. They collectively milked over 300 cows and that supported five families. The collapse of dairying in the early 70s, and, and several people have alluded to that today, saw the conversion of two of those farms to beef. Um, and there didn't really seem to be an opportunity for us uh, to, to dairy at Horden Vale. We also had a daughter with some significant health issues and support needs that would not be able to be met living in such an isolated place. So we moved and we started out as very low level share farmers, uh, eventually leased a farm, we built our herd and then ultimately bought a hut, um, farm at Larpent, just southwest of Colac. And we always heard tested. When I think about it, we never thought that you didn't herd test. We just thought that's what everybody did because it seemed so logical, uh, so common sense. When we first started out, we went to a sale in Gippsland um, with, a, with a very good friend. Uh, there'd been a really bad drought in Gippsland and we ended up coming home with 15 registered Holstein heifers that were a really good buy. And um, when we told Ross's dad about these heifers, because we had to, because it was going to be in the weekly time, so it's best to tell your parents first, um, his reaction was buying stud cows is the quickest way I know to go broke. So again, not a lot of encouragement there. This photo um, is one um, Brooke Sumnable took at our youngest daughter's wedding. She got married at home on the farm and it's a beautiful photo of Ross and some of his dairy farmer mates looking over the fence at the cows in the front paddock. Um, a week after that, Ross was in hospital having surgery for a serious illness. This is another bit of the story, and, it, and again, it might sound a bit odd to include it here, um, but this is our eldest daughter, Mia. Mia was born with what became obvious to be a disability. Initially, she had, there was no diagnosis. At six, we were told she had developmental delay due to an unknown cause. At seven, we were told she had an intellectual disability due to an unknown cause. There were clearly things that were different about Mia um, that we thought had a genetic core, but we didn't know what that was and no one could tell us. Eventually, we referred to the um, genetic screening uh, clinic at the Royal Children's Hospital. And when she was 15, we met with a senior geneticist there and were told about the Human Genome Project. And uh, we advised to be part of that project, which we did. But we were still told um, it was like trying to find a needle in a haystack and that we would probably never know uh, what had caused her condition. But we persisted uh, over the years. We continued to visit and keep in touch with the genetic geneticist and the people at the Royal Children's Hospital. And lo and behold, 
when she was 35, only six years ago, we got a diagnosis of monosomy 1P36.3 deletion syndrome. It's considered a rare disease, but is now actually identifiable in utero, which to me is amazing. Um, the advances in science and the difference it will make to other families to be able to have the information they need at, at a much earlier age than what we had. So, oh, that was the other thing. In this photo, this is at the launch of the National Disability Insurance Scheme, and you might see a quite famous Western Victorian vet in that photo, um, Dennis Napthain, who was the state premier at the time. I just wanted to share a few of the key learnings that I found um, over my 26 years as a CEO in a for-purpose organisation or what some people call a not-for-profit. And I think they're really relevant to, da to dairy farmers and, and all businesses. Really early on in, in that um, role, it, there was a real push around education, training, um, skills-based training, all of those sorts of things, and an acknowledgement that people can learn a lot across their lifespan. So we don't think people can go to university or do a trade and that's the end, you know everything, you don't ever have to learn again. Um, so our focus was very clearly on uh, encouraging staff to attend whatever training they could to participate in courses through their registered training organisation, all of those sorts of things. And I've always found that if you invest in your staff, um, you provide them with the right tools, the right facilities, um, the right processes that they can easily access, that re gets returned back to you. So you've got to see it as an investment. We ultimately had very low staff turnover. Um, really low work cover in this in that particular industry work cover is a huge issue and cost really low sick leave um, we had a focus on continuity continuous quality improvement so organi uh, organizations are uh, assessed evaluated um, all of those sorts of things so we were doing that long before they started doing that in the dairy industry so that that was very helpful for me but it also creates a mindset around always trying to do better you know yes set your benchmark get to that what's next what's next so that was my mindset in the tradition in the transition to the new national disability insurance scheme the way we were funded changed so we used to be funded in advance del deliver a service then equip for that service back and sometimes you might have had to send money back to the department but usually you didn't to a new system where you delivered a service, a month later you put your invoice in and you got paid. So a bit more like being a dairy farmer, really. Um, but, but for some organisations, they actually didn't have the reserves to be able to carry that. So it was really important to actually understand what your costs were, what your cost drivers were. And we worked with a fellow called Tim Flowers, who's an accountant out of Tasmania, and did some really terrific work around really analysing our business and what was it that was actually costing us money. Um, so there were some areas of the business, the way that they were going to be funded actually weren't viable. And, we, and so you had to make a decision and say, actually, I'm not going to do that because we're not going to be able to cover our costs. Again, you know, look at the dairy industry. Um, and the other thing was around evidence-based practice and shifts, which shifting the focus or the basis for decision making from traditional intuitive unsystemic um, experiences to ones that are firmly grounded in scientific research and data. Again, what we've been talking about here. So what I discovered when we did all of our evaluations that, that um, staff retention was a really key driver of profit. Um, and in, our in the dairy industry, that's a problem um, where we're looking at, at short-term people um, who are not in the business for the long haul and understanding the cost of constantly replacing, constantly training and what that's doing to your business.
the top the top things I've got there around herd recording, um, Holstein Australia membership, using Maestro, um, being part of the Ginfo project, and using the herd data app are all things that we've been, you know, doing for a long period of time. And then the bottom ones are kind of newer things that I've put on the list in terms of what data do we use and how do we use it. Um, we've always believed and will continue to believe that there's a premium available in the marketplace for registered herd recorded dairy cattle. And the evidence supports this um, and we've had a number of speakers talk about that today. But I still think that, that all these tools only work if you've got someone capable and interested enough on the farm to manage that data. And I know for some people that's now becoming an issue. Um, and also that the role and the value of doing that is actually um, recognised. It's often seen as, you know, there's often a comment of mum sitting on the computer again n n without an understanding of what that, how that's driving and supporting the business. If we go down to, you know, we, we have we're part of Ginfo, part of the using her data app, all of those things. And then I've drawn a bit of a line on my notes here to my ob and, and a little bit of a note to myself about that's about when I retired from my job at Coda. And um, I remember my quality manager saying, I'm so excited for you, Jackie. I'm so pleased that you're going home to the farm. This will be wonderful for you, but I'm really worried about Ross. And I said, what on earth are you worrying about him for? I'm going home to be more helpful to him. And she said, that's what I'm worried about, Jackie. She said, you've had 65 people to manage and direct and keep in line. And she said, now you've got Ross. And I feel sorry for poor Ross. <laughs> When I got home, I quickly realised that it was, you know, 2017, it, things were really difficult. They were difficult on our farm the same as they were on everyone else's. Uh, I quickly realised that the financial side of things needed to be managed a whole lot better and so we changed accountants and we used a web-based MyOB um, and that certainly helped. But again, there's no point in having really good financial data if you're not interrogating it and figuring out actually what, what are we doing that we could be doing differently? I quickly realised that fertility was an issue and that the cows were in charge of the, um, the breeding program, not the humans. The reports that I could generate weren't helpful so much because we're, we have a split calving herd um, and so you really needed to divide the herd in half. So I was really pleased to see Daniel's presentation before because that's the sort of thing that we've been looking for. We looked um, at a multi-pronged um, approach around doing um, redevelopment train in calf course with West Vic Dairy, uh, better transition management, um, and we put in a monitoring system on the cows, which is our Sense Hub system. The results have been remarkable in two years' time. Um, We've got now a much tighter calving pattern, even though it's split, um, and the machinery shed got converted into a calf shed. Um, while Ross was at a sale one day, I gathered some children and said, I've run out of room in the calf shed. What a problem to have. My frustrations are around really needing to enter data into multiple systems, and if someone could please fix that, that would be really good, all you smart people out there. This is an industry issue, and it does require attention. This picture um, I've put up there, uh, we don't show cows. I don't think our marriage would survive showing cows, um, but I still like a good cow. We still classify every year. This cow's just a picture I took with the iPhone in a work clothes. She's called a Bray Ice Fire Dolce. Uh, she's excellent 92.4 E STP Gold. And she's a de descendant of one of the cows that we bought in Gippsland all those years ago that was going to be such a waste of money. I don't think so. So the Ginfo project. Um, I got a phone call from Matt to say, you know, would you be interested in doing this? And I really thought that I was just holding the fort for Laura just for a little while, so our lovely Laura Calder. Um, and uh, 
but I'm still kind of here. Um, but it's been really interesting. Um, I've enjoyed the chats I've had with the farmers I've been able to make contact with, and I hope I've been able to help people um, as, as we work through issues. And I've just put some statistics up there around the number of farms that um, are participating in the project um, have risen quite significantly over the last little while. All our herd visits are up, the LTEs are, um, have nearly doubled over the four, last four years. The genomic testing of calves, and I think that's really significant um, that we're seeing such a, a, an uptake of that technology and hopefully we will see that even more. Um, we've got 50, over 50,000 cows in the reference population and we've been able to add the, the red breeds ABVs this year, which is um, fantastic for the red breeds and they're an enthusiastic um, bunch of people um, and congratulations on everyone who's been involved in getting that project up and running. Um, whoops. So I'm going to to circle back to um, to my first picture. And um, I know Simon is here and I've used a couple of photos that Simon took on the farm a couple of years ago for Data Gene. And thanks Simon for sharing those with me um, because we've really loved being able to, to use them. Uh, these are five of our seven grandchildren. The two townies didn't quite make it. Um, but my point is it doesn't matter whether it's our children or your children, our grandchildren or your grandchildren, to put the best science and technology to work in agriculture, to embrace and embed contemporary practice will mean that they will have a better future. The words of our eldest grandson, the smart one in the middle there, Tyler, um, we call him Tech Tyler. He's even got t-shirts with Tech Tyler on them. Technology's his gig. Um, is pretty amazing. If anything doesn't work, Tech Tyler can fix it for me. He's in the car one day with me in my new Subaru, which I was very proud of, and, um, and he's checking out all the gadgets and everything, and, and he looked across at me and he said, I must admit, Mimi, I thought this car was a bit too high tech for you, but I'm surprised at how much you can learn. <laughs> You've got to love him. We are all driven by different aspirations. Mine has always been to make a life rather than a living. Doing our bit towards improving our community and it's been, in its many forms has always been the most important thing for me. And I'm going to finish with a, with a bit of a, a slide here and I know that Dr Seuss is not quite PC just at the moment but I actually love Dr. Seuss. He has got some really important things for us to read and to learn and to understand. Um, so I'll leave that one with you. But, but two things, really key messages, or actually three, I'm gonna dump the third one at the end, is integration of data is, for farmers is really critical. Uh, we need all of these systems to be talking together and not be having to double or triple enter data to get the information that we need. We need it to be simple, concise, easy to access. Uh, don't overcomplicate it for us, please, because we're busy people. And for, for the farmers, it's really just do something. Um, and, and I've sat in on enough RDP meetings to see the frustration of people who want to help, um, people who just don't seem to be able to accept that sometimes you've just got to do something. You've got, we've got the information, we've got the knowledge, we've got the help. I think the dairy industry is very blessed with the amount um, of, of support that we've got and we need to use it. My third one and final one is for all you blokes out there, will you please go and have your health checks done? We've all been sitting back in COVID, um, not doing the things we need to do to look after ourselves. And we're not much good to ourselves or to anyone else if we actually don't look after our own health. So I'll finish there. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I really would like, because I've, 
I'm just sitting here realising we missed a great opportunity. I think there was our dinner speaker and everybody's here had the opportunity to listen to Jackie now. And I, you know, there's so much there. It doesn't matter whether we're selling widgets, cattle, life, dealing with your family. There's so much there, I think, that everyone could take home. So I do feel that it would have been, you know, would have been a lot of aspects there that we all could take home and think about what we can do. As a male, I'm going to take it on. I've got telehealth on Friday. So, and do those things. But I would, you know, if there was anyone that had a question, I'd Jackie be here. But I just, you know, sometimes we go through all these other aspects and just simple little things that talk about consolidating data. You know, James is up there talking the same thing. And the fact that some of the principles of the business that Jackie was managing all you managers in this room need to make sure that those are all the principles that you're doing. Doesn't matter what, because it's about the people you deal with. It's about setting, you know, understanding what the business is, understanding financials, and and having empathy. Um, and I like, you know, yeah, make a living, have a life. Um, I think there's all little bits as we we head away from this tomorrow afternoon that it takes. So, thank you so much for for your talk. It's, it was really. Here tonight. Thank you. Um, next.